Modern medicine heavily relies on the judicious and reasonable use of objective medical literature to make decisions about individual patient care, aka evidence-based medicine. In a 2016 episode of the excellent CBC podcast, Unreserved, Indigenous cardiologist Dr. Marsha Anderson Dakota used the term epistemic racism, prompting the question, can objective medical research be biased? And if yes, what are the ramifications? Hi, I'm an artist who ambivalently spent most of her 20s getting a medical degree. Life is short, so I'm now making a commitment to reinvigorate my creativity with art projects with a purpose. In this video, I attempt to make an illustration to elucidate the term epistemic racism in the context of medicine. Epistemic here is referring to evidence or knowledge production, and racism, well, really should need no explanation. Step 1. Research. Before putting paint on canvas, we need to understand the message in all its nuances. Here are five key points. 1. Knowledge production is political. Academia, corporations, governments, and individuals make deliberate decisions on what gets studied, who gets studied, and how things get studied. In the US, sickle cell disease disproportionately gets less funding than cystic fibrosis despite being three times more prevalent. This disparity is a reflection of societal priorities and inequalities. Sickle cell disease primarily affects black people, while cystic fibrosis primarily affects white people. Two. Framing medicine as an isolated biomedical discipline is delusional. Our bodies are the products of biological pathways, lived experiences, and environments. Medicine is framed as some universally benevolent apolitical institution, while its priorities are dictated by privileged people who think they can do no harm because they took the Hippocratic Oath at their med school's white coat ceremony. This is how we end up with this. Three. Colonialism is a healthcare issue. In the CBC segment, Dr. Dakota describes using indigenous frameworks of healing to holistically treat her patients, such as using a trauma-informed approach to treat a residential school survivor with cardiovascular disease. If your people experienced violence, genocide, land theft, and aggressive colonization under settler colonialism, the message is loud and clear. Your humanity does not matter to the colonizers. Would radically decolonizing settler colonialism states and institutions help heal from this historical trauma? Of course, but is that a lot harder than writing a prescription for rubastatin? Definitely. 4. Epistemic racism is rooted in the assumption that Western knowledge systems are superior. To constantly measure the validity of indigenous knowledge through this dominant settler lens is to say that indigenous knowledge systems can never be valid or valuable unless Western science says it is. Many cultures have participated in robust knowledge creation long before Western civilization was even a concept. These knowledge systems and practices were dismissed until relatively recently because Western research institutions did not study them before. This is epistemic racism. We should encourage looking at traditional knowledge through its own lens. Dr. Dakota argues, if certain alternative medicine practices have been studied to show no harm in the limited data we have, why hesitate to fund and incorporate them into the healthcare system if a patient asks for it? 5. Research methodology and not research methods is the root cause of epistemic racism. In the excellent book, Indigenous Statistics, a quantitative research methodology by Indigenous academics Chris Anderson and Maggie Walter, the authors argue that quantitative methods on their own are not inherently evil, so to speak. It's the back-end thinking that goes into how the study is framed and structured, aka methodology. As I said before, knowledge and knowledge production is political. Step 2. Ideation. Now that we've extracted some major points, we need to think of some illuminating visual ideas. Word lists are an excellent way to start brainstorming. I like the imagery of Enlightenment era hot air balloons. To show the positivist spirit of the age, I drew a man in a historical wig looking through a lens of some kind. Positivism is a belief one can understand the true nature of the world by objectively measuring it. This is the foundation of empirical evidence. Since the podcast segment is about institutional medicine, the image of surgeons around an operating table is appropriate. It's clinical, a 
methodical and vital, just like evidence-based medicine. I also like the idea of illuminating or enlightenment itself, because what someone chooses to illuminate comes with certain biases and assumptions. After all, epistemic hegemony assumes there is only one way to see the world. Step 3. Composition. Now let's try to put these visual puzzle pieces together. In my last video, I used Blender 3D, but this time I sketched it out by hand. I drew out various rough thumbnails of the scene, experimenting with different camera angles. I found myself picking between the Enlightenment era man with a wig versus the hot air balloon. Regardless, the key to this is to focus on creating contrast between shapes and values to design a readable image, especially making sure to limit myself to these three values. It was hard to pick, but I decided to use this thumbnail. Here I am using black and white to finalize more shapes and values. If you can read the image of black and white, you have a decent design on your hands. Using a combination of layer effects and gradient maps, I tried out some colors and settled on this one. Step 4. Execution. Gathering all my roughs, I go on to finish the painting. Because I spent so much time designing in the previous steps, this part is relatively straightforward. I was experimenting with new brushes and textures here. The palette of this is much more limited, but the textures make the flat colors much more interesting. As a final touch, I adjusted the levels to make the values and colors a tad more dramatic. And here's the final artwork. Some takeaways. Designing where the different shapes and values fit before putting color to things is probably not the way I enjoy working, but it is definitely the smarter way of working. Editorial illustrators have short deadlines and art directors to make happy, so planning is crucial before putting in all the work to polish a piece. Anyways, comment below to let me know your thoughts or any questions you have. Remember to like and subscribe if you like this video. Until then, stay safe, and hopefully I'll see you soon in another video.